<laughs> yeah, so Eva, you, you can tell everyone's delighted to have you here. And, um, and again, right, we want to thank you for arranging your, your, tra your international travel schedule, right? So you're back from Panama last night. Oh <laughs> and leaving for Nicaragua on Sunday. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, the advantage of, yeah, I know you well enough that we scheduled these things well in advance so you could re really arrange your schedule to be back here to be with us. So, um, yeah, biochem undergrad from Harvard, uh, PhD in molecular biology and cell biology at UC Berkeley, uh, UCSF postdoc, uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner. Wow. Uh, founder of the Nonprofit Sustainable Sciences Institute, author of A Low Cost Approach to PCR, Appropriate Transfer of Biomolecular Technologies, and a dengue fever expert. So uh, tell us a little bit about dengue fever and why should we care? Let's see, there are so many reasons. But, um, essentially, so how many of you have heard of dengue? Wow, very good. So um, there's, it's a really fascinating disease, actually. Um, I, I stumbled into it, actually, my training was in a completely different area, but I spent around 10, 15, 10 or 15 years, well, now 25 years, but at that time, um, a number of years working in, in Latin America on a number of different diseases. And everywhere that I went, I said, what are your priority diseases? And they would say tuberculosis, and dengue. And I had actually been trained in biochemistry and yeast genetics and then had kind of started uh, working on parasites and thought that that would be what I was going to work on. It turns out that dengue is a virus of all things. And I, of course, I had, I had, I was horrified. One, I couldn't spell it. I didn't know what a virus was. <laughs> what, you know, it, I mean, it, it's all about virology, immunology, clinical, and all this I kind of picked up along the way because I've actually never been formally trained in anything <laughs> that I do now. But, um, but and so dengue was a huge public health problem, and no, and there was just so little known about it that I just kind of, as they say, put your money where your mouth is, and you know, kind of came to it through the public health need, um, and so. It is a huge problem and exploding. It, it's getting, there's more cases, it's out of control in terms of its spread geographically, and the disease itself is getting worse. And I'll tell you about each of these. Um, and then there are no antivirals or vaccines or effective mosquito control. It's a mosquito-borne um, illness. And so that's why you should care. The other thing is that essentially the mosquito that transmits this virus um, is incredibly well adapted to our human ecology and behavior. And so it actually breeds in clean water around people's residences. So in the developing world, this is a huge problem because there's very little, a lot of, essentially it's, it's very well adapted to globalization and urbanization. So there's a lot of unplanned urbanization around big tropical cities. And so th there's essentially poor waste and water management. So there's not, there's intermittent running water. And so people keep their clean water in barrels and that's where the mosquito breeds. And then there's poor waste management, meaning the garbage isn't picked up every single day. It's you know, four in the morning or whatever it is. And so what we have is a lot of like tires and, and shoes and plastics and cans. And that is, it collects water from the rain. And that's where mosquitoes breed. But if you look around here, you have bird baths and all kinds of things. And that is also where in pools where mosquitoes love to breed. And it's clean water, not this skanky, gross <laughs> kind of thing you think about mosquitoes breeding. And no, it's in your own home, what, what looks like clear water, you can pick up and you'll see these little larvae kind of dancing around in there, which is really fascinating until you see them emerge into mosquitoes <laughs> that will then spread dengue to you and your loved ones. And so, um, and actually, just so I think you might have seen the, the press recently, but the mosquito that transmits dengue, which is, was been cleared up from the United States um, a century ago, is actually back in Menlo Park which is a huge, yes, it's incredible that it's here in California, yeah. Aedes aegypti, which is the worst, it's the one that spreads the epidemic form. So yeah, so now that's why you should care. <laughs> a very personal reason. Um, but the other reason is that, um, you know, so I talked about, so the number of cases, there's actually a, a paper just came out in Nature about two months ago that um, shows that the estimates that we quote from the World Health Organization are actually way underestimated. And it turns out there's about 100 million cases of dengue every year and about 400 million infections. And so the, one of these, the, you might say, well, who cares infections? Why should I care about infections? It means someone gets infected, they're immune, and then they don't have to worry about it. Well, it's more complicated because dengue is actually four related viruses 
really cleverly named dinghy, one, two, three, and four. Uh, and so, but the problem is that um, the way the disease works is that you tend to get a single infection uh, and you, you get very sick. I've actually had it and it's called la quebradora or breakbone fever. So, and you really know you have it. It's a, ter it's even when you don't die from it, you, it's, it's an appalling experience. And then you, for about a month or so after you're really knocked out. And some people actually are affected for up to two years. And, but the issue is that, um, that the second time you're infected with that, they're called serotypes, you actually are immune. But you, these other three are out there, and it turns out that when you get infected with a different serotype, your immune response, instead of mounting an, a, a proper immune response in some people to the infecting serotype, actually has a, an increased response, but against the previous serotype. And you end up with a misplaced, over-exuberant, immune response that actually can lead eventually to plasma leakage and, and death within 24 to 48 hours. So I mentioned that, yeah, and, and it actually is worse for more healthy people. Malnutrition is actually protective because the better your immune system, the worse your, this over inflammatory response can be, but not in everyone. So, you know, we have maybe 500,000 of these, this very specific plasma leakage syndrome out of 100 million cases, but you don't know who that's gonna be. And, and, and so, and there's no antiviral and there's no vaccine, but you actually can treat this. So if kids, especially kids, but it also it affects all age ranges, but most of the shock is in children um, and um, bleeding more in adults, hence the hemorrhagic piece. But you essentially, if you come in early enough and you see as you take serial blood samples across the days, it's only a week long. The whole hoo-ha happens within exactly five days. Um, but you can see that your platelets start dropping and your hematocrit, which is your packed red blood cell volume, starts rising. And when that happens, then you can know that that person is in danger and needs judicious fluids. You can also drown the patient by giving too much fluids. So if, and, and there's not that many doctors, especially in like these huge areas of the developing world that are affected, that know how to manage it properly. So there's a, you can have like where it comes into a new place, like in El Salvador, when it first came in, there was 30% mortality of severe cases. Whereas in Thailand, where it's been for decades, it's 0.2% case fatality rate. So it's, it's absolutely manageable, but people must come in early and you have to have nurses and staff who can be taking hematocrits like up to every half an hour. You know, once a day is too, it's too slow, it's too late. And I mean, it, yeah, so it's a really very terrifying disease for the population. In fact, Nicaragua and a number of countries are having a bumper year of a huge epidemic going on. And I mean, just heads roll. It's like politically really, really intense. It's a social upheaval. And so it's, it's a really intense disease. Um, from a number of different so, reasons. Social appeal? Yeah, because well, because everybody gets involved and in everyone's trying to control the mosquito and there's there's you know fumigating and doing all this and a lot of the things that it actually doesn't work because we actually just finished this very exciting random controlled cluster trial in Nicaragua and Mexico with about 44,000 people um, showing that you can actually really decrease not only the rates of the mosquito infestation in the home, but actually the amount of antibodies in children's saliva against dengue you know, like before and after an epidemic, so to really see which kids were getting infected um, by social mobilization, essentially giving the evidence to people in their own homes and having them come up with their own solutions. And that was, you know, so it's, there's a lot of really innovative things that you can do, but mostly governments just wait and don't do the prevention. And then when there's an epidemic, fumigate, so tons of pesticides, which are really bad. And actually the mosquito breeds in people's homes and the mosquitoes live inside people's homes. And so when you fumigate out in the street, it doesn't do anything, but it looks like you're doing something. So there's this like, no, yeah. And I was just at a meeting of the very high end meeting of experts and they're like, okay, well there's what works, which is nothing. And then there's what people, what the governments have to do just to like pretend that they're doing something. Um, but there's actually a lot of, uh, so there's, a, it's a big problem for all of these reasons. And there's a, but it's an incredibly in, interesting field right now because there's a lot of scientific questions. We don't understand really the mechanisms of this immune response or what's protective. And we have to understand that to make the right vaccines. So that's what my, so I'm also a professor, you didn't mention, I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, um, and I have a laboratory there with 25 people, and we work in the immunology and really understanding, we have animal models of the disease, we look at the viral replication and a lot of like upstream work. Um, and then it translates into um, Nicaragua, where I've been working for 25 years now, and we have a hospital-based study that's now in its 15th year on dengue. 
and a cohort study where we follow 4,000 children, 3,500, 4,000 children forward in time, and that's in its 10th year, the same group of children. And so we're working on looking at dengue, but also influenza and all kinds of other things which, which are going to be very interesting to, to look at. And to, of course, it's not just to look at, but it's, of course, helped the population. And, and a lot of the stuff that, that we do has um, always a scientific reason, but then we always give back to the, the country and the hospital and the people on each level so that they're actually using, and the Ministry of Health and the epidemiology, so that everything we do, they can actually be used in real time in the, the local setting as well as lead to publications, et cetera. So it's got this kind of double-edged approach to it. But um, yeah, so that's kind and of what, what, what we, we do. do. Well, so say more, so clearly you're coming in and you're working with uh, the ministries of health in these countries, right? You're not coming in at, at some grassroots mm. level, right? Yeah. Yes, although I, my approach really in everything I do is from the grassroots level, and I think that that's really important. So um, it, a lot of folks, especially with this kind of global, global health craze, kind of say, I'm going to work in Africa and here, and I'm going to make a contact with the Minister of Health, and then they're going to tell me who you know, the best to work with. And, and we do the opposite. We go in. We, we are very well known from uh, the other side of my life, which I think we'll talk about later, which is kind of scientific capacity building in developing countries. And so we've, I've been just not, not, not around a particular disease, but around just local need and listening, listening to what people need. And then through the nonprofit sector, being able to respond to that local need and build local capacity to deal with, their own, with people's own problems on site. Um, and so by doing that work, we've been we've become very well known throughout, especially Latin America. And so people have, you know, come. So then we start working. We start. And we do studies in it, and then it gets stronger and stronger, and it builds up. And then, of course, when we get large amounts of funding, then the ministry gets involved, et cetera. And the longer I've been there, of course, you know, I've actually gone through very different uh, polar opposite types of governments in Nicaragua, and been able to kind of manage through all of it because. They can see that you know we're working with the people, and it's making a difference in Nicaragua on many, many levels. And so it kind of becomes, I will not say immune, but somewhat resistant to the kind of political changes because it's really something which is working with with, with the with the people and with the country, as opposed to from the top down. So I think that that's an important kind of lesson as well. Yeah. So so yes, yeah, so just some of the names that that have shown up. The people have called you in the in in the. You, Lots of articles about you on the internet. Yeah, an activist researcher. There was a New York Times article that called you the Robin Hood of, of biotechnology. Robin Hood. Yeah, it was the New York Times. Um, yeah. So, so working with scientists in in developing countries. So, so mm -hmm. what's that like? Well, I think that that name was against this idea of kind of from the bottom up, and so. <laughs> it's, I essentially just had this vision that science essentially shouldn't only stay in the ivory tower. That I just, I, even though I was at Harvard and I was at Berkeley, and I was do had all the, the highest fellowships, etc. I felt this, and I love biology, but I also saw biology in this kind of very idealistic way as um, as kind of a model for human society. If you think about the cell. Actually, those of you who have said it, it's a beautiful system. It, it, every every element works together for the greater good of the whole. Not only at the cellular level, with the organelles and the DNA and everything kind of integrating in this very smooth, beautiful system, but actually at the level of the organism also. So all the different types of cells, you know, have all differentiated to be part of another greater good, you know. And so then, and the ecosystem as well. So I just I was very inspired by the pure biology of it. But then. You look around at the world and you go, gee, this ain't looking like some real beautiful <laughs> harmony thing going on, you know? So, what can I do, you know, to make science? I mean, I did my not just scientific activism, but my own activism and in the streets. And I was at Harvard during when Harvard was divesting from South Africa and, you know, during the, the Reagan 80s and all of the contra wars in, 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 in Central America. But you know, I thought, geez, I've got this like biochemistry degree from Harvard and you know this NSF fellowship. To, I mean, I should do something with it, with my own what will be profession. How do I make science make a difference? And everyone said, oh, you just get an MD, obviously. And I was like, oh, yeah, but I blood and I faint, you know. <laughs> like I can't. I see a needle and like I get woozy. Like this is not my calling. <laughs> so, but there was really nothing. I mean, global health. I mean, no one. In fact, even when I first came to. Berkeley as a professor, only like 12 years ago, I was I was um, interviewed, 
like, what do you call what you do? And I didn't have a name for it. I said, well, maybe international science, but it's essentially what we call, what's now kind of known as global health. And it just wasn't on the map in, in terms of an option. And, and, you know, you could work in industry or you could join the CDC or you could become an MD. And I was like, no, I pipetters, that's what I do. <laughs> so I literally, you know, as I took, after I finished at Harvard with my degree, I took, I had gotten into Berkeley and gotten all these fellowships. I turned them down and um, got them the next year, but I did just take a year off. And I said, I want to go to Nicaragua. I want to do something. There was a revolution there at the time. And I, and it was like an opening for health and education to actually be at the top of the priorities. And so I said, well, why not add science to this? And they, everyone just looked at me. So I literally landed in Nicaragua, and, and uh, of course, what I now know are the hottest two months of the year. Um, this was at the, actually at the kind of tail end, so that it was like already 10 years into the U.S. embargo. So there was nothing, like there was no yeah, water running, running water maybe once a week, you know, electricity, the Contra were blowing up power stations. It was, there was no toilet paper, there was no plastic bags, I mean, all this stuff we take for granted. And, and I was like, okay, let's do molecular biology, you know? <laughs> actually, I have to, I have to, no, I did not say that. I said, what do you need? And actually, what the, that was the second time I was there. Um, and it wasn't my idea, it was their idea. Uh, so I, I kind of wandered around. I mean, literally, I, had, I grew up in Paris, actually, in New York City, and had traveled widely in Europe and, and felt very privileged to have had such a wonderful life and education and I and and but I had I had when I want I wanted to learn what it was like in the developing world but I didn't want to go as a tourist and so I was kind of waiting for a time when I could be useful but the stuff I did just didn't seem that useful so I said <laughs> okay well we're gonna make it useful so I just kind of it was the first time I'd ever been as you know south of the border in that sense and it kind of landed and I had just learned Spanish because I spoke French my whole life and so I took four weeks of Spanish and learned enough except that I had gone to Barcelona which moves me a lot from the Spanish Civil War, and I wanted to live there. And I come speaking Castellano, and you know, with my and I come to Nicaragua, and they're like, "Oye, chica, qué tal?" And I was like, "Oh my God, I learned the wrong language." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, this is great, like, compañera." And I was like, "Really? What?" And the day I got there, this is amazing. The day I got there, the currency devalued, um, and so I was with a group that actually that was there for two weeks to do computer science, and I was there for several months to do biology. And, um, and so I couldn't, and so I literally had my whole savings was now like two days worth. And so I essentially couldn't stay in this nice bed and breakfast. And I ended up in this like brothel type thing <laughs> <laughs> with, oh my God, it was such a scene. It you was know, broken bed and broken light bulbs. And I was like clutching this few photocopies I'd made of this uh, book by Bruce Alberts, who became the president of the National Academy of Sciences later. But then it was called The Molecular Biology of the Cell. And I was just going, it's okay, I do know something. I know something. Because, you know, it was so utterly different from anything I had experienced. And I was like, okay, I got, well, you know, so then I, they dropped me at the Ministry of Health. And all I remember is there was like roosters running everywhere. And, and they were like, what can you do? And I'm like, Harvard, Paris, uh, nothing actually. <laughs> nothing useful. <laughs> but out of that, and then, and then, oh, then they had me go to this, um, the serum factory because the, of course the contra war was on and and a lot of the the, the, the cachorros which are the muchachos the, the boys in the in the city the young men were going to the selva to the regions around honduras and costa rica where the um, engagement was and uh, they needed uh, serum and so their serum factory was having trouble with endotoxins I mean, what did I know? And so they were like, here, fix it. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, let's, and so I go to this, and it turns out that the head of any suero, so it was called, it became my lifelong friend, and for 25 years I live in her house with her children, now her grandchildren, I mean, it's just, but um, she, they, they just, I had no idea what to do. I said, well, let's take some sterile water and try and do sterile technique. And there was, there was no hoods, there was no net, there was no Bunsen burners. So I remember I had someone take like a, I found a piece of cotton and we sticked it in some alcohol and lit it on fire. And I had these pipettes and I was like trying to do what's called sterile technique, which means that you actually have to flame your pipettes before touching the next thing. And it, was, and it ended up working. I think it was just a, nothing I did. I think it was a sterile water that I brought with me. But anyways, I ended up back at the Ministry of Health and, um, and started listening to what is it that they needed. And, and, they, and, and so I tried to support that. And um, that they needed was to be able to identify the strains of this new parasitic disease, which is not new, but it had emerged in urban areas, which is called leishmaniasis. And, and they were bringing it back from the jungles. And so I was supporting that and, and doing all kinds of things. And that's the same place I still work now, 25 years later. But now we have, 
you know, two or three million dollars of funding a year and these huge studies, et cetera, has come a long way. But at that point I said, well, what do you guys really want to learn? And they said molecular biology. And I just, I was like, oh, really? How do you do molecular biology without running water and without electricity? I said, but then I can't say that you can't learn this because it's not accessible to you. I have to make it accessible. I have to make it accessible. And PCR, which is called the polymerase chain reaction, some of you might have heard of, is a way of amplifying little pieces of nucleic acids or DNA, which can be used, it really was a revolution in, in, in basic science and diagnostics and in, in genetics and I mean, a zillion different applications. But at the time, the idea was that you, and still is, that you can, instead of um, essentially taking an organism from someone's blood and then growing tons of it so that you can identify it, you can just take a little piece of the DNA from that or RNA from that organism and amplify it billions of times until you can actually detect the DNA. And, and so then you can actually see that that person's infected or not in this very specific way. But it had just been invented here. Um, and um, actually here, very, very close by, um, at the uh, Chiron, Cetus, et cetera. And, and they, um, so that, what we did is we just made, essentially kind of handmade a system to bring it to Nicaragua with the very first pieces of DNA that would uh, detect leishmaniasis. And we're able to do that. The next year I came back and kind of made a course that was both classical molecular biology and this new technique. Um, and, and what you do is you do these serial rounds of amplification of the DNA and essentially the DNA is double helix and so you put it at 94 degrees and it splits apart and then you lay down these little pieces of DNA which are specific and will only recognize your target because it, everyone has and every organism has one single sequence that's specific to that organism and that's why they are that organism. So you sit down these little primers at maybe 56 degrees and then you add a polymerase which actually is it essentially will copy the DNA and you do that at 72 degrees and then you do the same thing over but every time you go to Two, twofold, then there's four, and then there's eight, and it's x to the two. So what you know, by, or it's two to the x, I should say. So by the time you've done two to the thirty, you have billions of this molecule, and then you can essentially have different ways to visualize that molecule. But so you usually what we do here is that you have a machine, and you put your tube with this little stuff in it into the machine, and you program, and you go home, and the temperatures go around the tube. Then you come back and you take it out and you do your little thing. Well, we didn't have that, and you don't, we, no machine, no electricity, so. Um, we said, well, we can do make twice a week. <laughs> and so then what you could do is you can actually make, instead of the temperature go around the tubes, you can make the tubes go around the temperature. And so what you do is you make three separate water baths at 94, 56, and 72, and then you just go like this 30, 30 times with a salsa. It's not so bad, you know, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem was that we couldn't, we didn't have electricity and we didn't have water beds. And so we decided to have Bunsen burners and ice and a thermometer. And literally, we did this and all of a sudden we had amplified this little piece of Leishmania DNA. I mean, it still gives me chills, honest to God. It was like everyone, we had this one little transilluminator, which is essentially with this UV light and you can visualize the DNA. And people were like pushing and shoving their way to like see this little band of DNA. And it just went, ah! and I just thought, oh my God, this is it. That you turn everything on its head. You know, you put the north-south, you know, you, you bring tools, you deconstruct them, you demystify them, and you make it work. And yeah, so we had, and there's not that much reagents. Oh, but actually Tom White and everyone, I mean, like Roche loved it. Uh, the people who invented it are all here. And they, I mean, I would go and they gave me tons of this free. They actually, I got a like, copy of the plasmid that you could make it yourself. It's the only time, even though I have a degree in biochemistry, I've never actually run a column and done any real biochemistry. But I did it for that. And I made millions of units of this TAC polymerase. And I told them and they loved it. And they just every year would have me talk and they'd donate and they'd give us, yeah, they just love this story because I'm it wasn't like a patent buster right I mean who has money in the places yeah. I'm working you know <laughs> nobody and I'm nor do I it. and I you know I don't know how to run a business you know I wouldn't so it was actually yeah so they loved it and we essentially made that work and then it spread and so then I'd be, I'm going on and on right I shouldn't be <laughs> I think you're gonna ask me a question but the bottom line is this all grew into this concept of of being able to build scientific capacity from the ground up based on a knowledge base, you know, and, and the idea therefore is to um, first listen to what people need 
and then respond to that need by bringing the tools they need and the knowledge they need in a totally respectful partnership and then continue working and bringing in other folks from the north, from the south, just to make people work together to solve problems, but in a, in not in a top-down approach. And the whole thing is a very horizontal type of ideally sustainable approach, although of course you know, you still need to find money and ways to, and so then we, I soon figured out that it's not just like the cute little pipettas that you can bring, it's actually connecting that laboratory knowledge with what's called epidemiology, which is the study of disease in that population. And what's interesting, and in many um, ministries of health, there's tons of samples that are, you know, that people, blah, 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 yeah, positive, negative, and then they throw out the sample. And the information is like unidentified, and it's just like this many cases of this, this many cases of that. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Connect this with the knowledge of the population. And I was not trained in epidemiology either, or biostatistics either, or immunology either. But you know, whatever, <laughs> you make it up as you go along. And so I connected with epidemiologists and biostatisticians at Berkeley and many other places. Um, and the idea was, you know, the idea of molecular epidemiology was actually um, uh, Lee Riley, for instance, who's a, a colleague at Berkeley, who's a leader in this field. And the idea is that you can um, essentially figure out not just that, oh, this is X bacterium, but this is this type or this strain. And then you can figure out if you have a hospital outbreak, is this because there are cases coming from the community or is it because there's nosocomial transmission in the hospital? And you can do that by typing the organism. And so, so that was a whole new other idea. But, so that was so exciting, you know, lab and epi, yeah. But wait a minute, who's going to fund this? And we said, oh, okay, well, we better learn how to write proposals, huh? <laughs> so then we added another piece of this. So there's like a triumvirate of learning how to write proposals and putting all that together. And that was like the workshops that we did. And then people were like, this is great, but now we have these results and we want to communicate them. How do we write a manuscript? And it's actually to get a grant, you need to write manuscripts. But in fact, I hate writing manuscripts. And it's a, it's a painful process. You write it, and then you get all these reviews, and they, they're all nasty. And you have to say, oh, thank you very much. This is a very great idea. <laughs> but the uh, very, very, very clever you know, <laughs> observation on your part, and et cetera, et cetera. So you, there's a whole like method and language and approach and like a uh, whole it's like a culture it's almost like you know there's like a, a method of a, and nobody teaches people you you learn it here you you learn it from your mentors you just learn how to do it trial by fire so then uh, we were so surprised and what do you want do you want to learn more pcr no we want to learn how to write manuscripts so this is all through our nonprofit. It became like our number one hit was manuscript writing workshops because people want to communicate their, their results to the world and learn how to do that. So that's become huge. And then bioethics, you know, that there's all kinds of issues around this. And so we teamed up with Richard Cash, a great friend from Harvard, and others who then did a series of, bio, of bioethics workshops. And then a lot of the stuff we do is by sequencing, you know, what does the, the virus look like? And then, but that's done in this, you know, there's their samples, but the, the sequence is done somewhere else. And then people analyze it somewhere else. And we said, whoa, that's not cool. The, people should be able to analyze their own sequences. So then we did phylogenetics workshops. And then, you know, so it kind of went thing, one thing after another. And then the stuff that really, I think you're going to ask what really came to the ground is informatics, which was completely nothing to do with me. But, you know, we have this huge studies, which are, um, you know, these 4,000 children, right? And, oh, one thing I didn't mention about Managua, there are no addresses. So there are no street addresses. And the way you get around is it's like, and that means from the little tree, but it's the little tree that was there in the earthquake in 1972. <laughs> no, I kid you not. So it's no longer, it hasn't been there for 40 years, right? But it was there and everyone knows that was El Albolito. And then 20 barras, barras is like it's not a block and it's not a yard, it's something in between. So that's how many of them, 20 of those things. Um, Al lago, which is north. And so, you know, there's the east, the west is arriba, where the sun comes up, abajo, where the sun goes down. Al lago, which is north, and al, mon al montaña, which is south. And so that's where you, how you get around. So this is like you're trying to find these 4,000 children every time they have a dengue case or to come. And so, and actually the truth is that people learn it pretty fast, but it's kind of like, hmm, okay. <laughs> so, so we, so we immediately, and then like, so, and the thousands of, you know, we have 150,000 consults for these children and every aliquot from them has 27, I mean, every sample, we have 27 aliquots so we can take very small amounts of blood, but have the blood cells. And then we have the DNA that we do something and we have the serum and we have the plasma. And we, and so, so to do that, this has nothing to do with me. The Nicaraguans were like, you know, could we do some like barcodes and some this and that? And I, we had actually been asked by our 
northern site visitors before we got the, the financing. Why don't you use barcodes? And I was like, are you kidding? What are we going to do with barcodes for here? Of course, if someone said, what are you doing PCR in Nicaragua? I'd be like, are you kidding? Of course we are. <laughs> but this was like informatics. That was like another field. So I was like, we don't need that. Or, you know, and so like two minutes later, two months later, actually, once we got the funding, the Nicaraguans came to me and said, you know, we want to use barcodes. We want to use GPU. We want to use PDAs. We want. I was like, okay, try it. And they, within two months, they had completely revolutionized the entire system. And now it's being used everywhere. But this was 2004. Um, and so we were really at the forefront, our, our Nicaraguan team. And they've been just innovating and innovating and innovating. And it's been incredible. It, it's an amazing system. Just we have millions of samples. And you just want a single one. I want that case from 2005. And here's your sample. You know, it's incredible. And, and then it went out from laboratory into public health. So using these tools for like the, the blood banks, for following um, pregnancies, for actually there's even this incredible pro project in the northern Nicaragua, which was to essentially, actually it's written up in this newsletter here, to essentially um, combat machismo in the very northern rural areas of Nicaragua to get the, the men involved in the pregnancies wow. and childbirth of their children, of their, of their wives, you know, and um, essentially by a cell phone behavior modification strategy, which we didn't develop the content, but our team did all of the coding mm -hmm. in, and all of the, and it was, it's been incredibly successful and very exciting. So, this is, so now we have an entire ICT, Informatics and Communication Technologies, piece of SSI of our nonprofit, which is based in Nicaragua. We just got a big Gates and Slim funded grant to like develop all these dengue tools and all this other stuff that's completely comes from the bottom. I mean, has, and, and, and so it's been like, you know, it's a, I just feel like it's a privilege, it's this incredible ride. You know, you never know quite where that horse is going, but you're hanging on to the tail, you know? <laughs> so. well, let's back up a little bit because yeah. I think people were fascinated, and I was fascinated, but as you're talking about the water baths and, and doing PCR and controlling the temperatures, and I know you've, you've talked about, um, uh, this kind of like um, uh, maker's lab, you know, oh. again, right? That that here here's this this big time director from this center in UC Berkeley coming to to the, to, to Nicaragua and right and they're and they're they're producing the blender views. Right. So tell people what the blender is. <laughs> well, this actually, yeah. So this, so we had this was during that period where we were doing a lot of workshops in different places, and so we were invited to Bolivia. Um, <laughs> And I should say that one thing that was eye-opening about going somewhere is that um, one thing was doing it in Nicaragua, but then we said, we like this idea but of doing the, the polymerase chain reaction manually, because then you really understand you know, that there's these three cycles and that you do this 30 times, because even if you have the money to buy a machine, you don't understand what's really yeah, going on until it, you do it. You know? and you yeah, and then, so this, we like this a lot. So the next course we did was in Ecuador, um, in Quito, and so we did that, and we got there like a week before to make sure everything was working, and we start doing it, and it, like the water bath wasn't working at 94 degrees, and I was like, great, and well, thank God we got here before, you know, just get another water bath, so we get another water bath, and it won't boil, you know, won't come to temperature, I'm like, okay, another one, yeah, so how, does anyone know how many meters high? 9,000 feet, okay, so we were like, oh, actually the water boils at 89 degrees, ha, huh. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that sitting there in Berkeley, did we? And so uh, this is like why you have to like get off your butt and like go to the place. And so, um, so what we did actually was ended up uh, um, with putting a, a layer of oil on top and it kind of approximated a, a closed system until we could get around 92 degrees and then the DNA will denature. Um, but of course, oil, you know, you have those water resistant pens. It doesn't say oil resistant pens. So of course everything that you've written on with your Sharpies is like, whoops. <laughs> but then we had some actually from well, probably one of your companies, you know, a, a cute little rack, you know, that has like one, two, three, four, five, and like someone cleverly had actually used the rack in the right order. <laughs> and so then we were actually able to figure out which was who. <laughs> but and then the two worst thing is that the next year was in Bolivia, and that's at 14,000 feet and the water boils at 80 degrees. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, you, you know, you got to go there. So it's the point was that we then did this course in Bolivia um, and uh, there was, but I, we did, we do these two phases of courses where we meet the people and we, te we teach around certain infectious diseases and then they have to come back the next year in groups with their own samples with a research question and then we actually process the samples and then you know, teach them how to do the epidemiolo epidemiology and write a proposal all in two weeks. That was like, the kind of method that we had developed. Um, and get they actually get a lot of they got a lot of funding from this. But so the second year, finally, I get to know you know this, this guy not 
Daniel Mamani, and, and he finally shyly invites me to his lab at the Universidad de Mayor de San Andres, which is in, in La Paz. And I go there, and his whole lab is like, it's, it's like Alice in Wonderland. Like, like, it's so, we walk in, and everything is like handmade. And you have like a little, what we call the blender fuge, which is a, it's a, it's a blender. And then it's a little aluminum bowl. And he's poked holes and taking those little widgets that fit on the, on the faucet. They kind of are like this and put them in and then it's like and you can put Eppendorf tubes into this and it's now a little centrifuge yeah. and so it was like the blender fuge and then he has another one where he took a record player and translated the, the rotational movement into a horizontal movement and it became a lab shaker. Oh. Yeah. And then there was this clothespin. So what we do when we when we look at the result of a, of a polymerase chain reaction is that you you run a gel and you essentially what you do is you take the, the negatively charged DNA and you run it towards a positive pole through this thing called, essentially it's jello. It's, 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 it's agarose, but it's, it's really like jello. And so the little pieces of DNA can wiggle through faster and the bigger pieces go slower. And you can essentially make a yard, you essentially, well, according to size, can separate your piece of DNA and you have a yardstick along the side, a molecular yardstick, and you can figure out if, in fact, the piece that you amplified is the right size. And so he, and, but sometimes you can't, you just turn it on, you can't tell whether the current is working or not. And so they, they made this little clothespin that you'd put it in and it would have a little LED, a little light would go on if the current was flowing. Oh. You know, <laughs> it's like really great. Oh, and the other one, this is the last one. So for years, actually all of this stuff got started, really talk about shoestring. I was gonna, when I walked in, she's like, oh, I like your, your necklace. And actually, I actually made this necklace and these earrings and this, I have like a minute, I like to make things. Um, but it turns out that when I first started working in Nicaragua, I literally, I made earrings and I sold them at fairs and then I took that money and I bought my first tube of tag polymerase. <laughs> seriously, I, seriously, so yeah. But anyways, um, so they have this, um, and so then people knew that I was going and my, because I was getting my PhD in yeast genetics, right? And so, but everyone knew that at, in the summers I would like take a month off and go do something strange in Nicaragua. And I was always like prowling around finding things that people had thrown out and I had a mechanical engineer friend and we would like make the vortex work and like make the power supply work and I would bring it down to Nicaragua and that's how we they usually got a European Union grant because they had enough preliminary data to show they could do this, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, so so the idea uh, was, was, was to bring, uh, essentially create the technology or bring it together and then build it up from, from, the, from the ground up. And so, um, yeah, that's, I think I went over my time on that one too. Oh, well, I have to tell one last thing though. So what happened is that I became known, all of the, like a lot of the women who, and the folks who, who support the laboratory infrastructure in many of our universities, um, in this case, were Latina because there's many Spanish-speaking people, and so of course they heard that I was doing this and got very involved. And so they would um, wash out all of the disposable, like plastic wares, etc., and then carefully bring it to me. And then I would bring it down to Nicaragua, and we would fill containers for, full of this stuff. Now we graduated to actually getting donations from biotech companies and things like this. But at that time, we literally would we would wash out the pipette tips. And, and But the problem, if you think about it, and that, you have to be very careful, right, because preliminary chain reaction, for those who know, is very, very sensitive. And you can get contamination very, very easily. So how do you get rid of DNA in the tip of it? And so we always were like, huh, we'll, we'll just take the like two conical tubes and whatnot. But this guy, Nathaniel Manmani, had figured out what to do. He, would, he took a tire, poked holes in the rubber inside yeah. the tire, like the, 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 like, yeah, like the inner tube of a car tire, and poked holes in it. And then put it into the, a lid of um, of a of a uh, like a plastic bottle, and then put a, then connected that to a faucet. And so you poke, you put in your little pipette tips into this, and then you put it in, and the, and the force of the water coming in forces water out through <laughs> these little pipette tips. So you get this complete washing out of the Clorox that you've used to break up the DNA and of the, of the, of the soap that you've used to wash it. And so you, you force the water through and then you can reuse these pipette tips. I mean, so when you say what goes, you know, innovation is, comes, is what you get in return. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, uh, I want to jump forward a little bit. Just, let's, you know, let's talk about, because I do want to leave some yeah. time that, so people can ask some questions. But talk, you know, you were, you were saying that you've kind of progressed now and now what are what are other ways that that Silicon Valley companies can help yeah. you and your work? So, progressed meaning 
I had when I got recruited after the MacArthur, I ended up getting recruited back to Berkeley as a professor and having to create a whole NIH portfolio and get a real life. Um, but the 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 fundamental um, paradigm is, you know, to put it bluntly. The North makes the ideas and then collaborates, ideally collaborates or, <laughs> in a partnership, but whatever, comes with ideas and then these are done in, in partnership with, with other countries. But the idea and the funding is, a, you know, is mostly being written from Northern universities. Um, and partnership, and, we, you know, and we've done as much as we can. In fact, now we have PIs in Nicaragua directly funded by NIH, et cetera, et cetera. But, but um, so what I have been able to do, although I must say it's very challenging with NIH collapsing as it is at the moment, but is to make scientific grants, get those funded, and then we do that in partnership, et cetera. And I tried, in fact, we, it's interesting, we have 51, or actually now 55 articles, scientific articles written with Nicaraguan authors, many of them first author, and not one single PhD in the country or in, in our group. And it's just by like, just people, you know, just by working and understanding it. There is, there are no PhD programs and I can't get a training grant to fund people to actually get a degree here. So we just go on without it, you know. But so that I've been able to do. But what's incredibly challenging is the capacity building part. But it's just, it seems so nonsensical to me. I mean, the Gates Foundation was like, oh, they must be interested. No, they're not interested in capacity building. Most foundations want like a gadget, a product, and to finish and there you go. But if you don't have an infrastructure of people who actually can take that and run with it, and not only be just the recipients, but be you know, trained and have ideas and be able to have their own vision and move with it, that little gadget that you just spent $15 million developing is gonna go absolutely nowhere. And you need to develop capacity for people to not just listen and do things, but to think, to have vision. So I call it the chin factor to look out and forward and be able to actually develop their own ideas and run with them. And that, you know, so the idea is that one of the things that has been very, very difficult to find is simply the, the training of people. And we have these, these workshops that we're very good at doing. We even have them like on, in, on CDs. We have we're actually innovating ways to make it more accessible. Although really having it in country with people from the region as instructors, it's all South-South, is very powerful. Um, and so those are very, we, they're not very costly, but those are incredibly difficult to fund. The other is that we identify through all of this work really smart, bright people in a lot, all of these countries. And we know, you know, you come in, you're like, who should I work with? I'm like, I know who you should work with. I mean, there's people who, despite all odds, are just totally committed to their work, to the health of their population, to their project. And we know who those people are, and they have the projects they want to do that cost six, ten thousand dollars. And I always had this vision of like, adopt a project. Like, you know, adopt a puppy. You know, I mean, really, I mean, come on, you can imagine for five or ten thousand dollars, you could make a difference. Like in Schistosomiasis or, you know, with Leishmania, Dengue, I mean, like really, you can actually transform, you know, enough because you want to just have a couple um, money to run a couple Elizas and then an encuesta, a questionnaire, a study design. I mean, they, they have everything ready to go minus the, the resources, but resources can go a lot further. So I always thought that that would be a great idea. Um, and so all that's for my SSI cap on that side, but I'm actually also the director of the Center for Global Public Health at UC Berkeley. Um, and we have, I won't go on and on about that, but we have a lot of very exciting projects. And one of them is to send students overseas to work on faculty projects as part of their master's degrees and PH degrees or as part of their, their PhD dissertation research. And we do, we, about nine or 10 students go um, to, the, to these sites throughout the world on very well established projects. Um, and it's like three to $5,000 for these fellowships. So I always thought that that has got to like be, a, you know, it changes their lives completely. And it's such a small investment. So I don't know. The, the things that are hardest to um, fund through kind of foundations and NIH are the things that are very human. And I always felt I just haven't ever connected right in the right way. <laughs> but I, I always thought this kind of adopt a project or adopt a student. I mean, these things where you have a personal relation with the person, you can actually see what your investment is doing on a very, you know, very personal level. I just always thought that that must be interesting to, you know, were I to have any funds, well, <laughs> I would think that that I would be interested in. For five or ten thousand dollars, if somebody wanted to adopt a adopt a uh, student or or, or, you know, or contribute to, or, you know, so that you then, yeah, or something, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be the whole bit, but. I just thought that, so that's where we have the hardest time is in the capacity building workshops, which go so far. I mean, you just, it's amazing. 
you, know, you teach one PCR technique, you come back later and they've now adapted it to like six other diseases, you know, and then they can tell you, and then they've trained all these other people and we did something in Lima and then we come back and they've gone to eight other cities and trained more people. I mean, it's, it's just a multiplier effect and it's, it's just so exciting to get, you know, essentially just plant the seed, as they say. So, so I'm pretty sure we've got, I want to leave some time because I'm pretty sure that uh, we, we've uh, got people that would love to ask you questions. And, and, I, and I think, um, Victoria and Ellen, I think probably if you look at the de degree per capita in the room right now, I mean, this has to be one of the, <laughs> the highest degree per capita audiences that we've ever had, I would say. Yeah, you talk about no no PhDs in the country, right? It's like, well. Yeah, <laughs> they're all here, you know, that's <laughs> why. <laughs> so let, let's, op let's just open it up. And, and like I said, I'm sure there's, you know, about science, personal issues or Experience, right? If you only need six to ten thousand dollars per project, could you finance through that through Indiegogo or Kickstarter crowdfunding? Were I to know about them, probably maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've kind of heard, but I have, we haven't set this up, so I will write this down. If you'd like an SSI pen, other than the one I'm using. <laughs> the two, the two one is, I think Kickstarter, and the other is Indiegogo. So the two, the two main okay. uh, crowdfunding. Right. And I mean, I've heard we have a little bit about it, but I haven't. We haven't like really explored this. Yeah. yeah. We, we just had a, a speaker at Toledo College that uh, financed a, um, uh, a special honey production through Indiegogo and hmm. um, and the beef raised and raised in Kenya. They're stingless bees, and they have medicinal properties. The honey does, and hmm. she raised like seven thousand dollars. So that's about the same that you're looking for, right? Great idea. Yeah, there is a specific one that you can use. I'm sorry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Pass Albert up in uh, yeah, oh, another room. Healthy. Mm -hmm. Hatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Hatch. Right. Yeah, that's also called. You'll tell me health, health something? Hatch. Health Tech okay. Hatch. She's a better okay. Hatch. Hatch. Okay. Yeah, she's an MD. MD. You'll give me this later. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I will definitely will look into that. Or anything like that, would there be sort of a PR piece to it to try to get out the word that, like, you have these big typhoons come out, and have these huge words out. This could be as impactful as the Red Cross coming into, you know, um, into the last disaster. So is there another component here that needs to be thought about, about how to drive people to... Helping this, because from a bang for the buck standpoint, it's yeah, and it, it's a little. So there's two points to that. One is our board is for of sustainable science institute. At any rate, is I mean they're mostly scientists, or I mean we it's I we don't really have the marketing type people. <laughs> so I, and I'm it's good in room. like one on one, but we we don't really have a real marketing plan the way we should. I, I think that there's a lot of different ways of, okay, great. <laughs> now we do. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think that there's, there's, and we're all busy, we're all doing this in our 0.1% extra time. Type. So uh, definitely we think about this all the time, but we just don't, we don't have the expertise to do this the right way. Um, the other thing is, is also it's kind of subversive and, and, and of course, if it was more than ten thousand dollars, that would be nice. But you can really get a lot done for ten, twenty-five thousand dollars, and not fifty million. But it's people. There's a way of going about things, and so it's kind of, sub, kind of to say, well, you know, that's great that you're investing all this, but we can actually do a lot of the same things for like, you know, x fraction of the cost. So they're like, mm, great, okay, next large fifty million dollar project. I mean, because there's like a way of doing it. So you know, but. I should say at the same time we we have had a lot of entree with Gates, but every time they've been a, about to fund our projects, which has happened about five times, they suddenly switch directions and hire a new person. So it's it's literally we've like missed the boat like so many times. It's not funny, but they always you know along the way have always come to us as you know okay what's the best practice, what's the how to do this. So we're like oh freely giving of our time, um, and so um, you know we, and we have very good relations with them now. And in fact um, you know have they we just received this funding for these ICT tools and whatnot. So, but not, but we have a number of um, again projects, but but it's not around the capacity building piece, which I still feel is is so critical. Um, I was just telling Jeff. I mean, foundations like to have something, and I understand that finish it and say we did it, but in having no recurring costs. But like, 
people are recurring. I mean, the more people, the more infrastructure, human resources there are, the more sustainable it is, the more, and you can do this multiplier effect, but it's, you don't want just one person. I mean, the more people there are who have knowledge and who make a, actually an exciting threshold number of people to interact with, I mean, the, all of that is good. So more is better. And, and so in that case, I think the re recurring aspect of humans is a good thing. <laughs> um, but, but that's like an issue. Like maybe there's a good way to market that. <laughs> so so what I, I mean, there's such this drive towards innovation and you're sort of trying to push back against that, right? In, in that you're really talking, innovation often is just the idea and then, all right, I've executed and then it's done. That's what you're talking about in the Gates Foundation. Oh, oh. Right? But you're really talking about this capacity thing, and so this is sort of a, um, you know, a, a, a real change of mind about how we really help. That just being innovative is not enough, and getting that word out is is, is got to be sort of a priority mission, I would guess. Today. Yeah, and I think I, I and I think innovation. I'm definitely not pushing back on innovation. I just again, it it has to be accompanied by. Um, a kind of interaction and a long-term vision of the people who are going to work with that innovation and also the innovation that comes from those people that you think you're going to teach, who in fact are teaching you. And the thing which has been really incredible with this um, project, this, this um, random control cluster trial that we just did, um, with its social mobilization, but it's really what it's been, is putting um, the evidence in people's hands and have them be the autonomous drivers behind the decisions about what they're going to do. And so there's been endless decades of, um, well, maybe three or four decades of, co of community educational campaigns around dengue. And every time I get up to give the, a talk, everyone says, oh, that doesn't work. Like we've shown, we did a community campaign. We did an educational campaign and it didn't work. We did it. And what does that mean? It means that you come and you tell people what to do. And, and for one prime example is that you, you see many posters and there's an, a big X around the mosquito and it says, no al dengue, X, and that's great. It means mosquito transmits dengue. But then what do people do? What's the action that people are supposed to do? It's to scrub your barrel, it's to throw out standing water, and people come in and put larvicide in water. And but, but then they're like, see that they didn't do it. They're not doing it. And and what we found when we went into the community, we had no idea what our message was going to be until we started talking to people. Mm -hmm. And the ciclo de vida, the life cycle of the mosquito, was was like the eje. It was like the central key. It was the click because what happens with mosquitoes is that there are eggs around the barrel or here or there. They close they, when the water touches them, and the the larvae come out of the eggs, and then the larvae grow in the water. That's why you're supposed to get rid of the water. And then after five days, they become pupa. And then out of the pupa emerge the adults. So the reason that you are telling people to get rid of their standing water and scrub the barrels is because those immature forms will become the mosquito. But it never occurred to a single public health worker ever to explain that to people. So why should these people who are extremely poor, extremely hardworking, you know, have many other demands on their lives and their time, come home and scrub their barrel. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Like, would you do this? Of course not. And then they're like, see, the community, they, we tell them what to do and they don't do it. And it's like, wow. You know, so what we did is we, and we came up with this concept, which was really born of the community, that it's not like every day you have to run around scrubbing your barrels. I mean, if you understand the life cycle, it takes a, at least a week to 10 days for this process to happen. So if you do this once a week, you can cortar el ciclo de vida sí mismo. You can do this yourself. You don't have to wait for chemicals, which aren't good for you anyways. You don't have to do it every day. You can do it yourself, your own two fingers. You can do it, but you have to understand. And it's that same knowledge principle. And it, and, and, but you don't know what's going to happen. So you, people get their own evidence, and they figure it out, and then they own it. And I think that that's the key in all of it. You know, this is PCR. This is whatever. To you figure out how to do it, and then it's yours. You know, but it's not, you can't just come and tell people, as, as good willing as one is, it doesn't work, you know, and here, so. Yeah, here, comes, here comes the Harvard. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you teach me. I mean, I have nothing. All I have is a little piece of photocopy thing. I, you know, I mean, I, you are teaching me, you know, you guys have been running a life much more difficult than mine is, and I'm here to learn from you kind of thing. You know, so I think that that's a really important mission, um, like message.
Can you check with care too? Because they, if you're doing something where the humans are actually starting it themselves and working it themselves, they tend to fund something like that. Uh huh. So and as I said, I think it's part of how to present that in a meaningful way. Because see, the right. foundations I work with, even you know, it's all about metrics. And so you can say I taught this many people and they did this many things, but they want to know how many lives were you know saved. And I'm like. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can tell you things and the multiplier effect and everything, but how can I really attribute lives saved to the training process? I mean, I can do it in potentially some of the dengue projects we do, but this is so fundamental because it's, but it's upstream, you know, and so that we've always struggled with how, you know, you can do narrative, you can, but I, in terms of what's going to really, you know, convince a, a funder or a, or a family foundation or a something. Life saved is very important, absolutely. Yeah. But the fact that the people within the countries who don't have PhDs are the ones that are working this out for themselves, that's a story that can help you get funded. Because that's a piece of care and mm -hmm. organizations like Care and Soccer after. And if you can get the PR out on that mm -hmm. sort of story, that's where you're going to get more help for the funding. Um, can I ask a question yes. here just because since this is seem to go in this direction, although I know there are scientists here and I don't want this to be only a PR kind of thing, so just want to be mindful of that. Just one quick question, and Jeff, I, just a, I know there are a lot of scientists here and, and bio people here. I know you have a press kit, a proper press kit, a media kit, you know, because I checked it out. So, so, did you put that together for yourself, or did someone? Press. I mean, well, I, if you'd like, we have some newsletters here. I mean, I even have a couple pens. Okay, um, but I mean, we have. I mean, we have a, a little folder with our nice well, articles and stuff like that. that we did not. Not a professional. So, so nobody put that together for you, because I. I mean, just just myself. I just thought. I thought you were. I mean, I was impressed. I, I oh, thought, great. I thought, <laughs> maybe, maybe we're not so bad. No, I mean, we have a, we have a communications person who works with us, you know, but it, and, and um, wonderful people, and, as, you, know, we, you know, we can write our stories, and we have them, but, but in terms of, like, the real, like, kind of marketing flair, you know, that, that we, yeah, so, but, but we have, I mean, we, we, you know, we get by, and we, you know, we definitely, we communicate, and we have our newsletters and our brochures, and et cetera, but, um, so I'm really pleased, thank you. But you know, a lot of it is is kind of this is what we've done. We're kind of like action people. But, you know, uh, but what you're saying your uh, need is is your need is for additional funding, and so what you're looking for is additional public relations that will get you additional funding. That's yeah, I think so, and also um, kind of potentially contacts. I, I just feel like I'm not sometimes connecting with the right set of people in the sense that I kind of feel like a family foundation, for instance, or somewhere where people are moved by people, like you were saying, by humans, where you don't, NIH or gay, I mean, that's not what's moving them. It's the metrics, you know, and so we do the best we can to count things, you know, and make metrics. And we, and we do that, right? I mean, I, I can tell you all this. I'm not making light of that. We have reached many, many people. We've, you know, several thousand. We've given, you know, however many hundreds of workshops and et cetera. And, and, and we have a lot to show for it and all the papers that were published and the, et cetera. So, I mean, we do do all that. I mean, it, it's professional. We, we can count all that. But I also feel that there's like an additional human element that I don't feel, um, it, you know, it, I, is, <laughs> I won't say not valued, but there's something where it's not, that's not the connection place with the places we're talking to a lot of times. Or, yeah. Just say a comment that in general as a, as a marketing professional. And, and, and Marcy, uh, Marcy and I have very similar skill set. Um, and I would say, and, and Marcy, uh, um, for purposes of discussion for this team, okay. Um, uh, I would say that that uh, uh, I I in, in Silicon Valley and in, in biotech, you know, there's this phrase called Marcom, which I, I, I personally abhor, but whatever. Um, and so and so um, Marcy and I overlap in Marcom. We're both Marcom chicks, okay. Um, and um, so, but but if you were to uh, dissect what Marcom is. I'm more of an ad chick, and she's more of a PR chick. <laughs> like, if you were, like, to dig around, sit around the Marcom pot, you know, and get into the Marcom, and sort of see where our strengths are within Marcom, 
I'm more of an, I grew up in, in New York in, in, in an advertising agency, so I was more of an ad chick. She's more of a PR chick, okay? But nice that to meet you. Not to anything. Yeah. Okay. So, having said that, all I want to say is that I think in general in Silicon Valley, having spent most of my career in, in the East Coast, that there is, a, there is a preference for things and for technology. And so that human stories, this, um, in Silicon Valley, my opinion, and you guys can disagree and, and pipe in and ask follow-up questions and push back, the human stories are a little bit, my, my opinion, mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, harder to, to get out. That it's a little bit easier to get TechCrunch coverage, for mm -hmm. example, you know, on the latest technology. Right, but you don't put that kind of story necessarily in TechCrunch. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Or you wouldn't go for uh, New York Times. Right. So that's where you can put those stories. And like CARES in Atlanta, forget where the soft is, but also. Mm -hmm. so so is in Southern California. Southern California. Yeah. So, and in that too, in Southern California, is a very human oriented place. Mm -hmm. Human stories oriented. So. And this is what something they're there to see. Um, is that, you know, I, I noticed a lot with uh, a lot of people who are, I mean, you're so wide brand. You mm -hmm. are just fantastic. You're such an incredible speaker. And your whole love for the science and everything, just, you know, it's fantastic. You need to get out there and kind of, like, get out there and push your story because you're the only one who can really sell it mm -hmm. because of your experiences, what you've done, just, and that's what's going to transpire, you know, other people who are going to hear it from you, get it from you, and kind of participate. Yeah. So it is a mm -hmm. part about, you know, the science is great, what you've done is incredible, but unless you get out there and kind of like now change your hats and, yeah. and do this other part, you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. So, so no, but I, and I do, there's, there's no, but I do, I do get out there a lot, but I don't, I don't, I think this is like this group therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> so I do get out there and I love interacting with people. I mean, you probably can tell that. Like, I love this, but I don't do good follow up. So I, everyone like floats out and we're all so happy, wappy. And then like, I don't, I'm too busy and I don't contact anyone. And I just, that, so that's I, that's the, that's my yeah. little Achilles yeah. heel or my well, big Achilles yeah. heel. Let's shift a little bit. Like, because, but yeah, this was not, I mean, this is really just to talk like, with you. It wasn't to be like, help, you know. Yeah. <laughs> let, let's, let me just follow up yeah. with that. One more thing. Um, when you're going to want to talk to people, don't do a TED Talk. I did, actually, yeah. I did about 10 years ago on a different, actually on a technology front thing. But I had at that point, I the, the project, the whatever it is that you want to fund, have a website, they can go, they can click, they can donate $10. Yeah, yeah. we know, no, we do. Yeah. So let's, let's shift, let's shift yeah. a little bit. Victoria's trying to get us to shift a little bit. So, yeah, you know, you know so, so we've got this scientist. You can do it in here. your kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> you are running water. Well, yeah. You know, and sometimes you get a little late. But let's see if you get, is, is there, is there a, a question coming from, a, from, from the science side? That, Yeah. So I think two things. Um, one I've already mentioned, but it's the informatics, the the link of informatics and biology. Informatics for transmitting results for you know cell phone apps. I mean, there's a million friends. We have another project which is really exciting called um, in collaboration with uh, James Holston, who's at the Social Apps Lab. He's an anthropologist professor at UC Berkeley, and it um, and it's called Dengue Torpedo. And torpedo in Portuguese is a, a is a text message, an SMS. So it's like dengue torpedo, but it's like, and it's a cell phone. It essentially takes advantage of gaming um, to animate, essentially motivate citizen participation in X Y problem is what he does. But we put the dengue content into that. So essentially, what it is is a cell phone game where you go and you eliminate breeding sites. 
And so you get points from identifying them. You get more points for getting rid of them. It's GPS marked, you know, so you either take a picture and show that, but then it, there's a website that shows where it is, and so you can see your actions. And then you get free text messages, you know, and the more things you get, or you get community gifts, and then you compete. Neighborhoods compete against each other. You get a blog. You get this. And it's now working, actually. The beta version is in one of the favelas in Rio called Favela da Mare. He's there now, and then we just got some funding to try and um, do some work work in Mexico. Um, and so that's like a very, you know, kind of, I, I think that is very much um, the wave of the future, as, as well as kind of taking the informatics out. And like, for instance, we're developing one called Dengue Specialist, which is taking all of our 15 years of clinical work and, and essentially collapsing into algorithms that can have real time support for met, for physicians treating dengue patients. Because a lot of times, again, those, those platelets and all the informatics you need to know, but they're done, but they're sitting somewhere and the, the physician doesn't even get the result until several hours or the, later or the next day. But they could just get that on as an SMS or as an email so that they can know right away this kid, like that's who needs the fluids right now you know so this is something and like epi results like all of these people are tested for dengue but they never get the response back even to the health unit that reported it it just everything is pulling information in and not bringing it back and so that we have another system called dengue alert that we're just so i think that's the one way so and then just, yeah just to follow up on that one of the things that really the movement pieces in the u.s is that um, the patient's right to get the information and so they get acted on it is there a similar thing going on internationally in, in global health? Because it's very, it's, uh, what I find is mm -hmm. that the, the patient will drive in his best interest mm -hmm. what needs to be done, just get the data to them. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, um, less so, I think, in a lot of countries. Um, I mean, even the, the reporting health centers and the doctors aren't getting the information. I mean, I, I don't know how the health system works here very well, but, um, and I'm not trying to say, or doesn't work here very well, but what I mean is I'm not trying to say there and here and it's worse there or it's worse here. I'm just saying that a lot of times I think that we don't, you know, that the information is not getting back even to the physicians and to the places that are reporting it. That's definitely a problem in terms of getting back information to health centers. It, it just, it's a one-way street a lot of times like into the epidemiology but not back you know but in terms of the people getting involved I mean everyone does have cell phones but the, the idea of individualized medicine I don't see it um, as present in the countries I work in but again I work in me personally work in the poorest of the Latin American countries so it's you know I'm, a lot, I'm sure in Brazil and Argentina and Chile I mean there's I mean I'm not talking about that in Mexico I mean I work but I work in areas that are you know depressed in those regions so um, you know many of these countries are in fact you know much better and than, than the US so you know I can't state that but I think the other thing I think is really yeah so, I mean, but conceptually, a lot of the stuff you're doing is really empowering the person in, uh, yeah. in the front line. And I think the data has the same thing. I, mm -hmm. I, so I wouldn't draw, I wouldn't distinguish yeah. those. If you can push the data back to the, the individual patient, level, yeah. you can get back to the doctor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even if they don't understand it, I think that... I mean, in our system where we have yeah. a zillion specialists looking at everything, having the patient center the data is actually the most efficient way yes. to do it. Um, yeah. Instead of having the doctors trying to communicate with yeah. each other, which is just doesn't, I know it doesn't work, it's broken. Yeah. So. Um, actually, uh, people are using a lot of technology in global health, especially with cell phones. Yes. And there's yeah. so many apps mm -hmm. out there. Yes, people use in these areas where their you know, cell phones are very common these days. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's interesting. Maybe um, uh, there is a lot of reporting back to health systems and this and collecting the data and collecting the data. But the, whether it's at the individual level no, of talking, doing that, I'm talking at, at the individual, individual level. level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. So that's that's happening in a big way. Good. Yeah. yeah well, I'd love to hear yeah. which which I mean, apps in between. I mean, if you mm -hmm. go to any of the Stanford Global Health talks, they have a lot of small. Yeah. Companies being incubated there, which focus on these, you know, apps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just don't wear your cow shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, this weekend will tell them. I don't have any cow shirts. <laughs> so it's probably, you know, we've, we've, we're, we've run a little bit late, and, and are you, uh, I know you've got to get back up to Berkeley because that's where you live. <laughs> <laughs> My son has, is ticking the time away. But yeah, no, I'd love to talk with people if they, yeah, I if can you've got say a, a little bit of time to hang out, mm -hmm. and, and they're, yeah, you're, you're, this. 
A you very exciting pen. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and some newsletters from both. Yeah, from and both. also if you're interested yeah, so in the Berkeley on the side and the side on the side. Newsletter on your website. Yes, okay. and we and have again, one coming out just like this month. And again, Eva, oh, thank you. You know thank what? You Why don't you sign up? Thank you. I